chapter 3.2, Middle Ages, part 4. So we're talking about the pilgrimages, and we're going to start to look at the um, churches. And we have a nice map of um, the routes. Sorry, I got frozen there. So the pilgrimages start in France. You have probably a fair amount of people more populated here in France. Um, I, I'm going to just kind of go off on a tangent for just a second here. Spain, which is very close, Morocco is just below in the Mediterranean. This was um, up until right around the time of these pilgrimages, this was um, dominated by Islamic faith, and there are some mosques and other structures there. So you notice how to the north is where the um, towns with cathedrals would be. Okay, so there is some interaction. There are mosques in Europe from a very ancient time. Um, we refer to this as the Spanish Moors, the Moorish period. Okay, so we have some beginnings of routes that we start, and then we come down, and they all convene into the Santiago de Compostela down here. Okay, so St. Foy is where we're going to start, and this is our church. It's a little bit hard to see because um, there's some other exterior, these towers, and there's some other buildings around it. But this is on a cross plan. So this goes across this way, and this is our apse right here. We're going to look at our diagram uh, for a moment. So the transept is this cross here, and then um, this is our west portal, and then it would go, um, the apse would face the east. So churches mostly. Um, are supposed to have the west or the um, occident, the occidental uh, opening to the west. That's where people come in. And then the last judgment is depicted usually on church doors or over toward the west. And then Christ would be hanging on the cross here, and it would be oriented toward the east. And one of the reasons for this is that the sun rises in the east and Christ is the sun, the S-U-N, as well as the S-O-N, um, and he is associated with um, the sun rising, so that's how the church is going to be oriented. You can see this right here. Okay, so we're going to go back. Oh, so here we are with our apse, and our nave is this larger segment of the um, uh, upright, if you will, or the long area. So this is a small town that was made famous by the uh, relics of St. Saint Foy, or Faith, the Faith, Saint of Faith. And um, this saint lived uh, and, um, in, sorry, in uh, 290 or 303 of the Common Era. So she was tortured to death um, with a red-hot brazier. I'm getting this from page 404. And her resting place was originally in Agen, A-G-E-N. Um, it's a much larger place a few miles away. And a monk stole her relics and brought them to Saint F to this area, to Conk. I don't know how you say it. C-O-N-Q-U-E-S. So it's kind of interesting that a monk stole the relics and then made the church famous. I, I don't know what to say about that. So it's a Latin cross plan, that's what this is called, and it's designed to guide the flow of pilgrims and the congregation. We're going to back up and look at the larger one again. So east displays a crucifixion, and the west is the last judgment, mimics the sun's path. Now we're going to back up again. So the ambulatory is the critical thing we're, we're wanting to know about in regards to the pilgrims. So we have the regular church service going on here with the apse here with um, the holy relics or the cross or both and then the choir would be where that's it's called the choir area it would include the actual people in the choir and it would include um, the monks or the priest or whoever is highest up and that area is not um, for the uninitiated that's not for uh, the laymen, the people coming in the church. There's pews all along here, um, but there are relics, perhaps, and different shrines all around. You see these little radiating chapels? Those are where the little um, relics or shrines that you'd want to come to see as a pilgrim would be. 
So if you follow where these little tiny um, X's are that are like uh, kind of dotted, this is how you're going to go around the church and notice how you're not even going to interrupt the service, right? Then you can go back out the door or you can go and sit in the pew. But it's important for you as a pilgrim to go around and see everything, go around each radiating chapel, say your prayers, and go around through all the way around. But there are so many pilgrims at this point in time that you don't, there's, there's other church things going on, there's other services going on, and you don't want to interrupt those on your path. So Western Portal, uh, this is called the Tympanum. Now this isn't in every church. These are Romanesque churches. This is early Middle Ages. The second phase of the Middle Ages is called the Gothic in Europe. Okay, so we have the regular arch. Part of the reason it's called Romanesque is because we're going back to the Roman arch, the, the curvature here. We're re-examining uh, things. We're not in the Renaissance. We're not totally embracing um, Greek and Roman thought, but we're starting to use some of the architecture and the um, uh, designs and um, different structures that we see around us. Because you have to remember, in France, as well as much of Europe, all of the evidence of the Romans from, you know, a thousand years ago is all around you. Those buildings are still standing. So then you're starting to examine how to build and you're starting to study these things. Okay, so we're looking at the different parts of this architectural um, doorway and the Vusar right here. These are stones. So these stones are slightly slanted here. So a little bit of a um, parallelogram or what we call a... Um, trapezoid it's not exactly a perfect rectangle so that they can fit in and stay together so their vusars are separate stones the tympanum is where a lot of decoration would be so they were illiterate again you know pictures were the pictures were important because they had their religious stories on them and for the layman the man who's uneducated not a part of the church formally for them to learn what's going on or the history or the important religious concepts they have to look at pictures so the portals or gateways served as entrances and exits and we go back to our tympanum lintel trumo and door jams these are all covered in sculpture and we're starting to um, have more and more artwork um, a little more prolific in this time and time and place so we have our beautiful arch here with our voussoirs. And then we have our um, image of um, this west portal. We have hierarchical scale. Uh, top registers, the four angels, the middle are Christ, Mary, St. Peter, and King Charlemagne. Charlemagne was a French king. And um, I don't want to get too into that right now. And then the bottom, the souls uh, guided to heaven or hell so there's kind of a decisive factor here this would be hell over here usually hell in uh, Christianity is the left side the left hand of God um, or even the apostles sitting on the left side of Christ one of you know which would be Judas so left-handed compliment you hear a lot of things with the left hand the right hand would be where the good things would be going on Okay, so he's got his hand up in here in a, in a in a gesture to the right, and then the left hand is what's happening uh, in the negative way over here. And you can see everybody looks very uncomfortable. So we have our registers. Remember these lines, and then also our figure is is larger. So Christ is in our in the middle. Did I say God? I, th I meant to say Christ. But anyway, there's a, a cross here behind him. Cross is here, and he's giving a benediction to the people on his right. There are angels here on either side, and then um, the people going to hell are over on the left of him. So then we get into the Gothic, which is the later part of the Middle Ages. Gothic precedes Renaissance, okay? So these were first built in the 12th century, and remember, Renaissance starts in the 15th century. So Gothic architecture gets higher, taller, bigger, and has stained glass windows and rib vaults and flying buttresses. Um, so this is Chartres Cathedral. And you might notice these two spires 
They were completed at different times, and that's why they look different. It took forever to make something this large. Think about this. There's no power tools. You know, you're working with stone. It takes a very long time to complete this piece, this whole structure. So 1260. We can see our flying buttresses here. So there's a flying buttress with a flying buttress coming off of it. A solid buttress will hold the weight of the dome or the uh, vaulted ceiling, but a flying buttress will do just fine, and they, they figured out some of this engineering to make it look a bit lighter and less heavy. Here's our rose window here. Now that's part of Gothic, um, is this large rose windows. They engineered this well enough so that they could start to open up the space on the inside and have it less heavy uh, looking. Interior, I mean, just phenomenal, stunning, gorgeous. You feel like you're in heaven. That's what the whole idea of the vaulted ceiling is. And the dome or curvature is imitating um, heaven, right? And then the light coming through is the divine light of God. Um, and then there'd be some biblical stories in the stained glass. And the light would come through that and then touch you. And it's just transforming, right? So you see our pews. We're in our nave. Here's their apse. You can't really see the transept from here, but it's over there. And we have here a labyrinth, which was um, sometimes put in stone or painted or, you know, in mosaic on a floor um, for various churches. And these are around today. It's like a meditative exercise. And it also can sort of mimic the pilgrim pilgrimage walk, if that makes sense. It's a way to walk in a respectful, quiet way. Um, that doesn't disrupt the rest of the church. So it's symbolic of a spiritual and physical journey. The ceiling is 118 feet high and the nave is 850 feet wide. Um, so our width here, side to side, that's 50 feet. That's quite large. Pathway is designed to guide pilgrims to the many chapels containing the relics. And the tunic of Virgin of the Virgin Mary worn at Christ's birth is here. Now a lot of these things we don't, you know, how do you verify this? Where's the DNA? We don't we don't know for sure, but that's what we believe. Okay.